couple weeks ago, Nolan reached out in, via a comment on our channel and began to ask us some questions about maybe what kind of new tractor or, or what size new tractor, just a lot of questions about a potential new tractor purchase. After a lot of back and forth discussion, we finally just said, Nolan, why don't you come down and, and we'll just talk about this. So maybe Nolan, you could tell us a little about yourself. Uh, we just moved into a new home and the lawnmower that we've been using uh, it still works all right, uh, but our new home is not flat level ground and our new home has a lot of trees and whatnot. So a lot more jobs to do um, around the house that maybe just not your usual lawnmower. What are you using handle. for a lawnmower right now? Uh, I just have a box store um, purchase Husqvarna. Yeah. And we've had it for over 10 years. So we've gotten a lot of life out of it, it's still working. Um, but with the hill, I think pulling a roller or anything like that up the hill um, would be a struggle for it. Yeah, pretty tough on a transmission of a, a, a small machine like that. Those transmissions are not really made to pull anything. So it, you probably do need a, a bigger machine. And we ran into issues at uh, the old house with level ground pulling the roller. So with all the, with the hill that we have now, I think we need a little more, a little more muscle. How much property do you have? We have an acre. And um, like I said, there's a lot more jobs to do and there's work to do at a new house to get up to the way that we'd like it. Okay. Well, you drove all the way down here to see us. I did. What questions do you have about tractor purchase? Well, for someone who's going out to look, are all dealers the same or should I go to multiple dealers like I would if I were purchasing a car? That's a good question. And the answer is it never hurts to go to multiple dealers. Maybe we should talk a little bit about brands first. We haven't talked a whole lot about what your brand preference is, although uh, clearly, you've been watching our videos, so I'm, I think you're probably leaning green. I am. But maybe for some of the rest of you, you're not necessarily leaning green, and we'd like to talk a little bit about just our opinions on that. Now, let me say up front, they are purely our opinions. So my thinking on tractors is they last a long time. Probably most any of the tractors fundamentally will last a long time. If we're talking about the subcompact tractors and up. These tractors have a, a, a quite a long lifespan, right? So for me, it's very important to have a brand that's going to be around as long as my tractor's around. But in my case, I really want a, a, a brand that's going to be here for a long time. I want to be able to get parts because if I can't get a part, a ten or fifteen or hundred dollar part might render my tractor useless, right? Without some expensive fabrication or or other work. So for me, it's very important. That leads me to one next step, and that is I want a tractor company that is manufacturing their own tractors. Of course, I'd love to be manufactured in the USA, but even short of being manufactured in the USA, I want them to have the financial commitment that they are making their own tractor. If they're just relabeling someone else's tractor, they don't have a lot of commitment. If sales go sour next year or whatever, change of management, they could say, ah, we don't want to be in the tractor business. For example, have you, how many Montana tractors have you seen? I don't know, I don't think any. You never heard of a Montana tractor, right? No, I have not. Okay, that's my point. A, a, a relabeled tractor from another brand was here for a few years and gone, right? If you own a Montana tractor today, getting parts is gonna be very, very difficult for all three of you. <laughs> no, there's probably more than three out there. Hey, if you have a Montana tractor, Comment below, we'd like to hear about it. That'd be, be interesting comment. Anyway, I stick with the top two brands because they fit that criteria. They've been around a long time. I'm certain they're gonna have parts. So for me, it's Kubota or Deere, right? I, I would narrow it to that simply based on the longevity of the brands. There's one other subtle aspect here and that is that they do sell the bulk of the volume. So there's gonna be more accessories available. There's gonna be more information online for do-it-yourself service. More attachments are gonna specifically name them as being compatible or not compatible. They will have been tested maybe with that particular unit. So rather than just having to say, I have this hydraulic flow or I have, I have this lift capacity, you can say, will it work on my 1025R? Will it work on my Kubota BX? Right? And more informational videos available. Yeah, those are my reasons for sticking with the top two brands. Now, once we get into those top two brands, we've got a whole series on the Kubota v BX versus the Deere 1025R, and I think you've seen that series. I have, and I've lived part of it now, that after I've uh, been here with you today. Yeah, in a, in a following episode, 
you're going to see Nolan uh, ride around on the 1025R on some of the same test course that we used in the, in the test, and it'll be interesting to see that in the future. So that's kind of what I choose on brands. Um, now you talked about specific dealers. Let's say you've chosen a brand, should I go to multiple dealers on that brand? I don't think it hurts, folks. If you've got two dealers close to you, that's even better. Competition works. If one dealer has a tractor on the lot that they really want to sell, they may be eager to, to do that, just like a car dealer. Really no difference in that. Uh, don't be scared to, to push your dealer a little bit on price. They probably don't want to hear that, but it's true. You know, you got to feed your family just like they got to feed theirs. Don't expect them to, to, to sell you a tractor for nothing uh, because they have to make a profit or they'll be out of business. Right. Understood. But it certainly doesn't hurt to, to compare some pricing and compare some availability. Is a 1025R too much tractor for one acre? <laughs> you know, I think it depends a lot on you as a person. Let's talk about several different aspects. One is the cost. You look at the cost up front, and let's say we're comparing to a lawn tractor that's capable of, of pulling your roller and, and handling, you know, say 60% of the jobs you need to do, the mowing and the pulling a trailer and, the, and that. Uh, but of course it won't handle the rest of it. You're still looking at five or $6,000 for a lawn tractor like that. And then at the end of that time, what you're gonna see is that that lawn tractor's not gonna be worth very much money, right? So over the course of say five years, it's gonna cost you four or $5,000 potentially. Uh, I'm using numbers off the cuff here. So again, it's my opinion. Differences in the comments is fine, but it's gonna cost you a, a good bit of money and you're gonna have essentially nothing at the end, right? When you buy a subcompact tractor, certainly one of the big two brands, you're gonna retain a lot of resale value, right? Yeah. So the net cost to you at the end of five years, 10 years, may even be less. Uh, certainly over the first couple, you'll see some depreciation, but then the depreciation begins to slow down over the longer term if you take good care of your machine and, and don't have some serious disaster with it, right? So from a cost standpoint, I think it's kind of a wash if you, know, if, if you can afford it. If you can't afford it, you shouldn't spend it. Uh, that's almost true no matter what's going on. As to whether you need it or not, again, this is you. Do you get enjoyment out of doing this type of work yourself? Or when a project, a serious project comes along, do you say, I just dread that, I, I, I just wanna pay somebody to do it? Someone who works out, who would like to work outside more and enjoys doing that, I, I think uh, having the tools to do that at home would be very beneficial for myself. Yeah, and so from that standpoint, there's no problem at all with, with seeking a subcompact tractor for a one acre property. Again, I started on half an acre and technically I had no need for it at all. In fact, it was almost embarrassing, but I used it a lot. I used it a lot on my own property, and then I found that all the neighbors wanted help, and I loved doing that. I did it for free for a long time, and it brought me joy, right? And so it was, it was a very positive experience for me. And I think that'd be another benefit also, being able to help out family members who might need some projects done or things like that. It's being able to use you know, something that, that I have to help them out. Yeah. Now, when you're evaluating your dealer, it's not necessarily just your salesman that you're evaluating, right? Sometimes people say, I go into the dealership, uh, the salesperson didn't really seem like he cared or didn't seem like he uh, wanted to sell me a tractor that day. Uh, yeah, that's important. But once you buy your tractor, you're not gonna be dealing with that salesperson very much. You're gonna be dealing with the service department and the parts department. So I would recommend when you go to the, to the dealer that you ask, to kind of meet somebody in the service department, meet somebody in the parts department. And then when you get a, a minute or two to talk to those guys, have some questions prepared. You know, maybe like, uh, what type of problems do you typically see with this tractor? Now, of course they'll answer, oh, we don't, we don't see hardly any problems at all. Well, when you have the tractors in, what do you have? Oh, well, you know, you'll have them in for service. But still, you can kind of tell by a, a few minute conversation, you've learned in your life, you can yeah. tell whether, um, a person is genuine and whether they're really caring about spending the time or whether they're just trying to get you get you out of here. And I think that's important because a lot of people tie their dealership to the sales person that they're dealing with. And I don't think that's necessarily fair to the dealer. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, something to consider there. So when I do decide to make a purchase, 
Do you have to take the attachments that are on the tractor or can you defer some of those and just get the tractor? Can you decide what you want on it or does the dealership decide that? Multiple questions there that are really good or at least multiple answers to that question. Uh, a lot of times you'll see the tractor, you might see a subcompact tractor, doesn't even have a loader on it, doesn't have a mower deck on it, it doesn't have anything on it, it's just a bare tractor. It will take them a few days to get that tractor equipped the way you want it. So contrary to a car purchase or some other purchase that you can just walk out the door with it, you may have to wait a few days to get your tractor because they may need to configure it for you. So typically they will have tractors that are nearly bare and so you'll add the attachments on that you want. Uh, it's very common uh, on the subcompact tractors to get the mower deck and the loader, right? On some brands, mainly John Deere, you have an option of getting a backhoe, right? On most other brands, they have a specific model that has a backhoe, and so you either choose that model or you don't. Okay. John Deere tries to make a big deal about, hey, you can add our backhoe on after the fact, right? I could, I could decide to buy a backhoe later, and, and that's true, but I would recommend you to consider buying that backhoe right up front, and it's a financial decision. If you go to buy a backhoe later, they don't like to discount that much, but if it's in the tractor purchase, they will discount it at basically the same rate as the tractor, okay? So if you think there's any chance that you want a backhoe, I would consider that from day one, okay? Now obviously you can trade for another one, but you, you, you lose money because somebody's got to make money on that trade-in sale and everything. Other attachments like three-point hitch attachments, uh, additional items like that, they're going to be the same price pretty much, you know, and you can Potentially, you can buy them from a third party, maybe one of our sponsors, you know, that's, uh, that specializes in that particular attachment type. And you might get more what you want than if you buy it directly from the dealer on that first day. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely yeah. does. And uh, you can also distribute those purchases. One of the, the factors that encourages people to buy their attachments up front is the 0% financing. And I personally have a little trouble with that. I love the 0% financing, but I hate to see people paying 25 or 30% more for an attachment just to get the 0% financing. I also hate to see people getting attachments that they don't end up using very often just to get that 0% financing. So sometimes you learn more as you go along. You say, you know, I really didn't need a box blade. A land plane was what I needed. Why do I have this box blade out here? Or I really did need a box blade and I got a rear blade. And you know, so I think you learn more over time. That yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so Tim, my next question is, is there a better time to buy a new tractor than others? You mean like a season of the year? Yeah, should you buy in the winter when maybe sales are down or is there not a time when sales are down? Is it? Foolish to buy in the summer when everybody's starting to use them again. Well, if you go into the dealer, the dealer says buy now. Now is the best deal ever, right? And Every time. Next season won't, won't be near this good a deal. There are several things that have been very consistent with the, the two major brands. The 0% financing has been ongoing now for ever since I bought my first tractor six years ago. It may change, but interest rates are still low. I don't see any reason why the 0% financing has changed. Now, I have seen the discount structure change from list price where they might say there's a, a $500 rebate or they might say there's a $750 rebate or they might say there's a thousand dollars off if you buy two attachments. Those are deer sponsored specials and they do vary a little bit. I haven't seen any seasonality to them. I just see them come and go. So I'm not, I'm not really sure that there's a whole lot of advantage. One thing I do notice is that dealers sometimes have leftover stock. Now I'm not gonna get hung up on model years. I'm just gonna say they've got stock that's been there more than six months uh, and they really wanna get rid of it. Those are the times where you can get a tractor at a more competitive price. And these okay. tractors don't change that frequently. The only disadvantage to buying a tractor that's been on the lot for six months is that it's set outside for six months. You know, maybe that's not that big of a deal. They're, they're pretty, pretty hardy. Okay. Is there any advice you would give someone from your own experiences, maybe to avoid before they make a purchase. You gotta consider everything before a purchase and you got so many things going through your mind, you just, it, it's, it's hard to really think of everything, isn't it? The biggest mistake we made pre-purchase was we didn't consider storage. 
you know, here I am uh, uh, trying to get the very best deal on the tractor, trying to decide exactly which options I want to include, and I'm laser focused on that, right? I'm going through the brochure and going through the internet and, and just, just really studying on that. I get the tractor home, and it is almost like I was a little kid, and I go, uh-oh, where am I going to park it? Christy, you should put the car outside. Nope. <laughs> you couldn't park it on my side of the garage. We eventually put more money in the shed where we stored the tractor than we had in the tractor. So that was my biggest mistake. Or maybe you could say it was my shrewdest move that I didn't get finance committee approval for the shed. But once I got the tractor home, well, I have to have a place to store it. I mean, you know, we're not going to spend that much, you know. So you can use that for your finance committee or not. I yeah, we'll worry about that. It can sit outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to let the equipment sit outside. It really is. But that's probably the single biggest pre-purchase mistake we made. Okay, that's good advice. Yeah. So Tim, uh, I guess my question for you then is, how could you help me decide what size of tractor is right for me? I mean, do I just need a lawn tractor? Do I need a one series? Is a two series way too big? How do I make that decision, uh, especially if I want to be helping out other people oh. on other properties? Oh yeah, so you're going to be doing maybe some work on some other properties too. Uh, this is a hard question and I'm going to try to probably answer it a little more generally than just, just for you because I think maybe that'll help some of the viewers. I think our channel kind of illustrates this. Uh, we, we have found that the tractor is only as good as the attachments. So if I have a pot of money that I'm willing to set aside to invest in my tractor habit, I could either spend it all on the biggest, most expensive tractor I can afford, or I could spend a less amount on the tractor and reserve some of that money for attachments. So for instance, I could either buy a 1025R complete with a backhoe, or I could buy a 2032 without a backhoe. I don't know that those numbers add up, but you, you, maybe you can see my point. Yeah. Likewise, I might be able to buy uh, three or four more attachments for my 1025R than I could for my 2032. Same with my lawn tractor. So what I would try to, to do is, is focus on something that's maybe the smallest that you think can accomplish your goal. A lot of people try to say bigger is better. Well, if you have an unlimited budget, that's true. But I think it's important to get the attachments with your tractor, and I don't mean the same day, but don't limit your tractor's functionality simply because you don't have an $800 attachment or a $1,500 attachment. You know, an example that I'll just give you, we can talk about attachments in another episode maybe, but an example I give you is the grapple, right? The grapple totally transforms the 1025R. I would much rather have a 1025R and grapple for a lot of what we do than a 2038R with no grapple. I know that sounds crazy, but that's, that's, how we, that's how we've come to realize the value of these attachments. Not just the grapple, but several others. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically choose what can take care of the most needs that you have and also you can equip the way that you need it for your individual needs. Yeah, I mean, you may want a larger tractor. There may be a lot of people that could say, really, I could use a two series, maybe even a three series but my budget doesn't really allow that. You see, there's another thing here too. As you get to bigger tractors, the attachments are a little bit bigger and they cost more too. So it's, it becomes a budget constraint here at, at some point. And keeping that tractor, the smallest one that'll solve the problem, can kind of help you be able to afford some of those attachments going along, right? A four foot tiller is a lot cheaper than a six foot tiller. Just make an extra pass and save some money. Yeah. You know, in that case, there's, there's really no harm to a four-foot tiller versus a six-foot tiller, right? I mean, it, like you say, an extra pass, and most of us want the extra seat time anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's, that's my answer on that. Now, you have to make the decision, what's the smallest that will do the job, right? I think a lot of the things that you've described to me off camera that you want to do really need a loader. And as far as I'm concerned, the subcompact tractor is the smallest tractor that is practical with a loader. Yes, you can get a, a third-party brand loader for the X700 series, but they're so expensive, you know, that the tractor and then the loader, you're essentially in that same price range. Yeah. So it seems to me like the jump is from a 500 or so from a budget standpoint of an X500 to a to a, a, a one series, right? That's your choices there. And I think you're gonna find that a one series is probably about the minimum will do all the jobs that, that you've kind of listed for me. And we'll go into detail on some of those 
uh, jobs that that he has listed in a in a in a follow-on episode. And Nolan has has this helped a little bit? I mean, are you or do you feel a little more comfortable about your purchase? Yeah, I do, and it's been a big benefit for me to be able to ask you these questions and you know as far as for example going to multiple dealers and being able to i guess have some information to go into it with so i'm not walking in there blind and kind of look like a mark walking in there you know someone who doesn't know anything let's see what we can get out of this guy so yeah i feel like this has given me even more confidence walking into you know multiple dealerships to see you know how i can get the best situation for myself as yeah. far as picking up a subcompact. Yeah, don't hesitate to take some time and, and study on the internet. There's a build your own tool for deer. Uh, Kubota has a similar tool where you can configure your tractor and go in and see all of the options that are available and study each one of those options to see if that's something that you need on the tractor. Um, several of those options, again, they're gonna be discounted if you purchase them with the tractor, whereas they won't be discounted later. That's an, one more point that we might mention, but you'll also be more knowledgeable and you'll be able to talk to your salesman with a little bit more intelligence. Absolutely. That way I can have an idea of what should be expected from the dealer as opposed to just assuming that what they're telling me right off the bat is the way it is and that's how it is for everyone. You don't want to get home with your new tractor and watch a video and say, oh my goodness, I, I wish I would have chosen the other mower lift option or I wish I hadn't have chosen the more expensive mower lift option. By the way, on mower lift options we have a a page on our website which describes all three of the mower lift options for the 1025R. Did you know that there were different options? I did not. See, there you go. So spend some time studying that and you will you will then be able to have a uh, an intelligent opinion. I mean, it, it, it you still may not make the right choice in the long term, right? I mean, none of us may, but having said that, you will make a decision that you're, you're comfortable with rather than just taking what the dealer recommends. That way you have no regrets. <laughs> Hopefully no regrets. That's our goal here. Nolan, thanks for stopping by. And thank you guys for watching. I hope you found this helpful. We'll see you next time on Tractor, Tractor time, time with, with Tim. Tim. Okay, I do not want a cat nibbling at my ISO tunes while I'm doing an interview. today and I've got one challenge remaining and that's to try to figure out how to get this machine here into our checked luggage.